Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is neither a camera nor vintage and explains in part why the word mostly appears in the channel title. What it is in fact is a JJC JF U2 3-in-1 wireless remote control and flash trigger. Now I saw this listed on Amazon recently for £27 and uh, it struck me that uh, if it works as one would hope it could be quite a fun little thing. So let's go ahead and see what's in the box. Now this, uh, there's a couple of odd things about the listing which I want to investigate. It said it was specifically for Nikon and it listed a number of cameras and it also said that um, it didn't wirelessly transmit TTL information. And I thought that was a bit odd. Why would, it, why would it be a Nikon specific product and have all of these pins on the hot shoes and not transmit TTL? Only work with manual flash. Many of you watching will of course already have worked this out. So we've got a transmitter unit, which is this one, and a receiver unit, which is this one. So turn the right way up. Uh, this would go on the camera if you're using it as a flash trigger. Uh, and this would go on the camera if you're using it as a camera remote. Now I had a look at the JJC website, which is a pretty reasonable sort of a website for this type of product. There's a little instruction leaflet. In English, among others. Uh, I speak English, uh, and to my shame, nothing else. So that's what I'm interested in. Let's have a look at this accessory pack. Oh. Ooh, there go the batteries. And there it is back again. Get all this stuff out of the wrappers. Now the bit that I think makes this Nikon specific is this cable which as you saw was loose from the other accessories. This connector I believe is uh, an MC2A connector, I think that's what Nikon call it. So if I was using this as a wireless remote or a radio remote I would plug it into what would ordinarily be the receiver. Not the best fitting plug, it's quite positive. And then that would screw into the uh, front of the camera. Now my Nikon is this guy here. This is a uh, very dusty uh, D7100 and if you have that type of connector it would generally be under a cover around about here. Now my D7100 it actually uses an infrared remote uh, and so the remote release capability of this product uh, isn't going to be that useful to me. But I bought it primarily because I was interested in its operation as a flash trigger. So, just to recap, if I was using it as a camera remote, that would go on the hot tube, that would plug into the socket on the front, I would turn this to camera, and on the transmitter I would simply push the button and it would fire. So having said all that, let's put that cable to one side now and we'll look at the flash parts of it. I think what I'd like to do is investigate what's actually inside these units uh, and confirm my suspicion that only the middle pin is wired. I think these other pins, I mean they're quite nice pins, they're sprung loaded and everything. Uh, but I think only the middle trigger pin is actually wired up on these units, which is why it doesn't do TTL metering. Uh, I suspect, therefore, there may be a posher version using a similar thing. So just inside, we've got some 
I think it's called dip switches. I don't know very much about electronics, I'm afraid. And these can be set in one of 16 positions. So there's a second position, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on and so forth. Let's put them back to where they were. So we get 16 channels, and on this unit there is a matching set, and obviously they need to be on the same channel. Uh, so let's go ahead and have a look inside. Let's put some of this stuff to one side. And rather than have you watch me take this thing apart, we're going to skip forward to the uh, dismantle state. So let's take the screws out and let's just prise the case open. That was easy. And there we have it. So that's the button that is the trigger button on top of the unit. That's quite nice. The, the insert here where this little plastic button goes actually has a key so that the button seats correctly against this little tag. And whilst this probably isn't the right moment to do this, I do note this little um, contouring on the side of these units. So if you are gripping them to slide on and off of a product, that's actually quite nice, quite easy to grip. But let's have a look at this circuit. So it's actually in two parts. This is the, let's go a bit further, back in a moment. Okay, so uh, I've taken the screws out of the hot shoe. Um, on the subject of the hot shoe, we can see all of the pins have a, a sprung loaded cushion to them. And then this metal part is held on by another little screw here. The metal part is quite important as we'll see in a second. So this is what screws into the hot shoe and as I suspected we can see there's a center pin here with a track going down to this solder pad and then this second wire is the return that goes directly onto the metal shoe. That's why there's no TTL wireless metering because only the center pins wired up, even though it has all the pins there. Looking at this circuit board, we can see where the red and black wire go in. There are two pads on either side, two solder pads, which aren't used. So that would suggest there is a more sophisticated version of this. This is marked R433. So it's worth knowing this works on a 433 megahertz uh, radio system. I believe that component is called a surface mounted audio wave resonator, but I could be wrong. I probably am. Uh, so that's actually doing the communication and I would imagine that's an aerial. So there's our 16 channel selector. That's a little control chip. And I'm saying these things as though I know what I'm talking about, and I really don't know a great deal about electronics. On the subject of the um, radio frequency, the 433 hertz, that is commonly used uh, in home automation devices. So if you've got a, a Nest or a Honey uh, central heating controller, or your curtain rails work through some app or another, you might find if your flash trigger is erratic, in a, in a home with those sorts of features, changing the channel might uh, give you a better result. Because there may be some interference from other devices in your house. So that's the trigger. Should we take a look inside of this? Actually, we'll take this one apart as we've got the battery cover open. Back in a moment. So, very little to see here. Just the centre pin again wired up, so it's not like this was a sophisticated receiving unit with two-way communication, and it was paired with a cheaper transmitter. Both both devices are 
fairly basic in that sense. Not much to see here, little microcontroller, dip switches as before. So there is a switch that switches from camera to flash operation. And that I would assume is simply rerouting the, the signal to the uh, connector here for the camera remote or the flash terminal for flash operation. So let's put all this back together and uh, try it with a few cameras, try it with a couple of different flash units and um, see what we think. So everything is back together. So let's uh, try this on a couple of flash guns and a few cameras and see, uh, see what works and what doesn't. So start with, let's just pop a flash unit on one of the triggers. Screw that down, turn that to flash, it's already on. And this is um, quite a modern flash unit. Try and get it in frame a little bit. It's a Sigma EF610DGST. It has TTL metering, but of course we know we can't use that with the uh, JJC trigger. So I'm going to put it on not just manual flash, but a 16th power manual flash. And I think when we press the button here, there's going to be a flash in 3, 2, 1. And that works fine. I'm just going to cover the flash tube for a second and draw your attention to this uh, little light here. So when I press the release button, this little light will flash. So there may be a flash from the flash in it as well. So flash in three, two, one. And yeah, you see there's a little green confirmation light to say it's working. And we get a little light on the transmitter as well. One more time. Three, two, one. There you go. So that all works fine. Um, let's try a different flash unit. Well, in fact, no, let's, we know this works, so let's stick with this for the moment. Let's try uh, putting the camera, the flash trigger on a camera. So here's my Nikon uh, D7100 again. Just gonna slot that on. Before we even do that, one thing that some people uh, are worried about uh, is flash triggering voltage. So when you fire the, the flash unit or anything connected to the camera hot shoe, it's going to um, put a voltage across the camera circuit. And some old flash equipment will uh, essentially run at very, very high voltage and on a modern camera, and even some old cameras may damage it. Now one thing we can look at on the original box is at the bottom here it says ISO standard hot shoe. So the hot shoe fits or is uh, compliant with some sort of international standard. Now there is an international standard for flash units and triggering devices that go on cameras and for the cameras themselves and I think it's ISO 10330 and the standard is something like the flash can put out no more than 6 volts or the trigger and the camera has to be able to accept up to 24 volts so there's a built in margin of error but I'm just going to run a current through here and see what the voltage is I don't know if you can see that on the screen just about little bit fiddly. So, centre pin, and that doesn't look quite right, does it? Let's go up to the next setting. Start low. So I don't know if you can see that, but I'm getting uh, a voltage, fairly stable voltage, is three and a quarter volts. So this is going to be perfectly safe for any modern camera. Uh, on the other hand, 
as Americans say, your gas mileage may vary. And um, yeah, just uh, perhaps do your own testing before uh, risking an expensive piece of kit. But for me, I'm happy to go ahead and try this out. So whack that on there. I should do the screw up. Flash in three, two, one. One more time. Flash in three, two, one. So let's try it on another camera. This of course is a digital camera, DSLR. Let's try it on a mirrorless digital camera. This is a fairly basic Sony. Flash in three, two, one. So that works. What else can we try this on? Well, how about a little Olympus trip? So this could actually be quite useful and expand kind of the creative opportunities for a trip. If it fits. Ah. That's interesting. The pins, these lovely spring-loaded pins we looked at earlier, are fouling on the hot shoe. So I'm going to try and ease the trigger onto the hot shoe by pushing the pins up. There we go, it got on there in the end. So those uh, those spring-loaded connectors are really quite uh, firm, let's say. I'm just going to test flash. My flash has gone to sleep. Let's turn it back on again. So let's see if a trip will trip. Flash in three, two, one. Yes, it does. So now we can take our flash unit separate to our Olympus trip and hold this you know, above and to one side. Uh, we can even add a little soft box to the flash unit. Um, now when we're using a digital camera, when it comes to exposure, we can just take a photograph and see what it looks like on the little TV screen on the back. With some flash units, you'll get a lookup table. I've got something similar here. Looks complicated, but essentially in manual mode you read your distance here let's say six meters or, or uh, 20 feet and then you look up at the scale above and that lines up at f eight and a half so you can set your camera to f i guess eight and away you go now if you wanted to do some sort of fill flash you're going to have to take an ambient exposure reading, look at your aperture options, and of course you can just move the flash unit to and fro until the flash unit distance gives you the aperture you want. But equally if you wanted to do something clever like uh, shoot at a wide aperture to get a blurry background, and then um, your, your flash sync speed is going to be set by the camera usually, particularly on a vintage piece of kit. So you might want to consider using something like an ND filter. So if your ambient lighting is saying you want to shoot at f8 at 125th of a second, but you want to shoot at 2.8, uh, 2.8, uh, 4, 5, 8, uh, a 3 or 4 stop uh, ND filter would enable you to do that. But if you are trying to balance flash with ambient lighting on a film camera, you're going to have to do some trial and error or um, get a, uh, an exposure meter and flash meter and that could help a great deal. And let's not forget with this kit we do get two triggers, so potentially we could trigger two flash units, so uh, a main fill light and a hair light for example. So uh, really potentially expands the creativity of a trip. 
or any uh, similar camera so long as you can get the thing on there let's just try that again no it's just yeah if you jiggle it around a little bit it'll go on maybe bit fiddly i think if i was using this uh on a, a camera where it didn't want to go i would simply take this apart and take these four pins out they're not doing anything so they don't need to be there and fouling on the hot shoe that's the olympus trip i've no idea if this next one is going to work we've got a a minox minox model c and for this so i've just taken a look at some of the accessories that come with this and i had imagined that this coiled up lead in the packet would have terminated in this uh, kind of sink socket which is pretty standard but it seems that it doesn't so if you wanted to use a camera that had an old uh, or a, even a current uh, sink socket connector <clears throat> you're gonna have to mess around with a hot shoe to PC socket adapter I don't have one to hand at the moment so I can't test it on uh, on my Minox that has that type of connector or my for I select and also has that type of connector which is just here so that's a little bit disappointing that it didn't come with that connector so let's go ahead and try it on a different flash gun and uh, I think we can find something very different in actual fact <coughs> so this is not going to fit on the bench but uh, you can probably see it says uh, Elastolite Luminate. This is a kind of uh, studio monobot flash unit. This is a 200 joule one or 200 watt second one. Just see that there. Now generally you would use a sync cable. This is the basic connector. That has that connector on we just looked at a second ago. And then on the other end, it's got uh, what looks like an old uh, headphone socket almost. And that plugs into a socket on the back. What we do have with this kit is one of those large plugs. And we have an adapter here. And on the side of the trigger, a socket we saw earlier. And then we can plug this into the back of our flash head. Uh, this might flash, but it didn't. Turn this to flash. Turn the power on, that's on. Flash in three, two, one. Yep, that works fine. I'm going to turn the small flash unit off. I've got both flashes connected right at the moment, so I'm just going to fire that again. Three, two, one and they did both fire so both triggers work perfectly well together I'm going to turn the small one off um, so yeah that, that works just fine so I'm not suggesting this is going to be a good choice for a proper professional uh, portrait studio or something of that nature uh, it is a, a relatively low cost simply made um, and, and frankly inexpensive device but if you are uh, running a, a portrait studio and you're using an expensive uh, flash trigger or expensive flash system with remote control and something goes wrong for the 27 pounds uh, which I guess maybe $50 that this costs having one in a, in, a, in a drawer somewhere might prove to be a bit of a lifesaver and if you have bought some secondhand flash heads maybe and you're running a home studio in your spare bedroom garage that sort of thing this could well be a uh, fairly useful tool for you so let me just dismantle all of this and we'll have a, a look at what's left i'm going to unplug this it may again flash three two one it didn't so that's quite good it's not shorting out uh, as you move it it is microprocessor controlled so what can we conclude uh, it's a useful flash trigger 
It has the potential to be used as uh, a camera trigger if your camera has a suitable connector. Now you see this is what catches people out. I just turned around to find this other lead that we used a second ago and of course it's still plugged into the back of the flash gun. So uh, if you do ever lose a connector uh, in your home studio, check the flash gun. So I can't tell you how good it is as a camera trigger because it doesn't work with my camera. As a flash trigger, so long as it's got a good connection and uh, on some older cameras perhaps you might need to press these sprung loaded pins in a little bit, it does seem to work pretty well. Um, at any rate, that's been the JJC, what do they call this thing? JFU2 flash trigger. Oh, one last thing before we go. Because this is running on a radio signal, rather than, for example, infrared, this should work perfectly well outdoors in bright sunlight. So if you are using this as a fill flash, or to trigger a fill flash, that shouldn't present any problems. Uh, anyway, that really is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it, and do have a good day.